don't have to get quiet like that. It's like it's all dramatic. <laughs> you can keep talking. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Welcome home. Everybody, I have a I have a, a pro tip for everybody for the uh, eclipse. You know, many of you you guys wore glasses, mashallah, right? Who wore glasses when they saw it? Okay, if you do what I did, and you didn't wear glasses, then you can see it for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. Anyways, all right, we are clearly hmm. It's because it's a joke. Okay, look it up, <laughs> look it up on Reddit or something. Okay. Bismillah, bismillah. Let's just go straight to the halaqah, I think. That's probably a great idea, inshallah. I hope everyone's doing well, inshallah. There's a, uh, the joke was that bad, a baby's crying. <laughs> there was a, there was a, a, a palpable, tangible, um, you know, the, the, last, the last night of tarawih is like always so interesting. You know, Ramadan truly is a guest. You know, it's like the most honored guest. And Whenever you look forward to hosting a guest and then you host them and you enjoy their company and then as it becomes time for them to leave, you know, it's almost like three days before they depart. It's like already feels like they're leaving. It already feels like the departure is happening. And, you know, the 27th night or the Khatam of the Quran, you know, I know Valley Ranch did theirs last night and some Masajid have been doing theirs. It's like the climax of the month, but at the same time, it marks like the beginning of the end, right? And the departure. That doesn't mean that, you know, a person stops making dua. No, of course, you know, up until tomorrow night, we're even going to have our annual event. We do our farewell Ramadan uh, event on the last day of fasting where we sit and we make dua before Maghrib comes in for the, for the first of Shawwal, for Eid. But at the same time, you know, this is a point of reflection and this is a point of, of contemplation. So I wanted to go around the room and ask everybody, you know, raise your hand. You can share with everybody. Uh, what's one thing this month that you loved about Ramadan this year? And let's make it something that's not maybe the same thing as every year. So some people are like, oh, my mom brought out the secret samosas, you know, the, that only show up in Ramadan, the puff pastry ones. Um, try to make it something maybe a little bit specific. Take your time and think about it. There's no rush. But Raise your hand if you have something that happened this year particularly. Yeah. Okay. The sense of community. What do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? Alhamdulillah. Yeah. She said, I felt like I was able to enjoy Ramadan better because all of the brothers and sisters... We were all able to connect on the same path. And that's so true. You know, have you guys ever tried fasting outside Ramadan? It's hard. It's hard. I travel a lot in Ramadan and people ask me like, oh, do you break your fast? And I'm like, never. And they say, why? I said, because it's, it's so difficult to make it up when everyone around you is not doing it. There's like that collective momentum, that community momentum. Um, even praying Fajr or praying Isha or praying Tarawih, like, Sometimes it just takes one good friend. And we learn in Ramadan the true definition, the true meaning of righteous company. When you spend time with people and that person motivates you and encourages you to like read another page of Quran. Or, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay for the lecture. Like you're getting up to leave. You're already thinking about it. And the person's like, I'm going to stay for the, for the khatara. And you're like, yeah, I'll stay too. Like just that microsecond of a decision that person may have given you is enough to change the trajectory of maybe even like your last 10 nights, right? So the community is so important in the month of Ramadan. And I think that looking back four years since the COVID Ramadan that we had, where everybody was staying home and watching the recitations online on YouTube, and it's just such an incredible reminder of how important this is, right? This experience, whether it's here or whether it's any other masjid uh, in the country, inshallah. Good. Anyone else? Some of you enjoyed? Yeah. In the brown. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I don't want to ask him to like <laughs> reveal himself. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> she said, my brother has gotten closer to Islam. You know, 
that the 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 path i don't want to put him on the spot so i'm not even going to look in that direction the path to coming coming closer to allah looks different for everybody it looks different for everybody in the sense that there's different there's different stops there's different trajectories there's different angles right but subhanallah it in some way it all feels the same and it feels like coming back to where you belong when you come back to allah you just feel like you're back to where you belonged the whole time and and when you were away from allah when you decided that when you were ignoring your responsibilities and things like that and kind of you know indulging in different things you just kind of felt like lost or disconnected or whatever right i'll get to it at some point and maybe it was again a good friend who brought you maybe it was your parents maybe it was who knows you know but when you decide that you know what this islam thing this muslim thing is something i want to do and i want to do it organically independently subhanallah it just feels like coming back home after a long time and Allah always welcomes. Allah always welcomes. One of the commentators of hadith, there was a, uh, there was a hadith that mentions that, you know, Allah loves his servant more than a mother loves her child. And, and we know that Allah is not like anything, right? As the Quran says, that there's nothing like him. But one thing that's interesting that the commentators ask on that hadith is they say, like, why, when it comes to Allah, do we see a comparison being made to a mother? And the commentators write, you know, they reflect and they say, oh, well, the mother loves their child more than anybody, et cetera, et cetera. But then one of the things that the commentators write that I think is beautiful, which is, you know, the mother is basically what makes home feel like home. Meaning if mom is home, then, you know, that's home. You know, that's why they say home cooking. Like when something is there, it just feels like you belong there. And in Arabic, one of the words for home is you know meskan or meskana is a place that brings sakina so when a person comes back to allah it's like all of that is felt this sakina it doesn't matter if, if if everything around you seems to be confusing or problematic or you know that when you're with allah you need nothing else right so we ask allah ta'ala to keep us all close to him and for those of us that have family or friends or maybe ourselves that we are struggling to come back to allah may allah make that path clear for us May Allah take away the haze from our eyes and our hearts and allow us to walk on that path, inshallah. Anyone else? Any brothers? Yes. Absolutely. Gaza changed Ramadan for the world, without a doubt. And they're getting all the hasanats for any inspiration, any uh, uh, reevaluation. The Gaza absolutely changed Ramadan. The brother said that everyone wasted less, we thought less. You know, even here, we, we used to give a lot more food and kind of be more like, you know, feast, feast. And now we're like half a sandwich. Bismillah. See you later. Because really, no, in reality, like food d was no longer the center point of this Ramadan. I feel like as an ummah, <laughs> I'm not speaking on behalf of Zuhur Fest. They have their own. But as an ummah, right? Zuhur Fest is not the ummah. But as an ummah, I feel like everybody just stopped I don't know, focusing, that's a good word. Not caring, but focusing on like what's for food. Well, we used to actually have, subhanAllah, last, last couple of Ramadans and then before COVID as well, people would literally every day, every Monday and every Thursday we had a thought, there was a comment. First comment is what? What's on the menu? What's on the menu? And I would always respond the same thing, food, right? Because in my, you know, in my estimation, like shouldn't be the topic right if you fasted all day whatever we put in front of you should be enough inshallah now we're going to do our job and make sure that we have good food and is delicious food inshallah right but at the same time now the perspective has been opened up to everybody and everybody is thinking similarly and we think to ourselves like this is not really the focus of my month you know where are we going to eat what's the post move i i have not seen a month a, a ramadan month where so many people just come to the masjid with whatever, like a date, some water, maybe a, sma a sandwich, a protein bar, a protein shake, whatever. And they're like, no, 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 my focus is actually to be here. You know, I'm going to get some coffee. I'm going to go wait in the musalla, right, with my coffee, spill it in the musalla. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I'm going to wait there nonetheless because I want to make my Isha prayer on time. Isha has been packed. Taraweeh has been packed. I have not seen this many people stay through eight raka'ah before. And I look around and it's all like our age. And something in Gaza changed us. And may Allah give them the reward for that. Something in Gaza changed who we are. And, and, and of the tragedy and calamity that is still happening till today, 
the, the heroes of this entire narrative are those who remain undefeated. On the 27th night, 200,000 people in the Aqsa compound, undefeated, undefeatable, right? And through their resilience, all of us are changing the way that we think and the way that we make decisions. May Allah Ta'ala give us, inshallah, thabat and make us firm, inshallah. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Last one? Ramadan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, bring the kiss of Sarawih. Absolutely. It's incredible, man. Passing on the flag. You know, we just talked about this last night in the Khatira. Like the, the, the worry that the prophets had was about who's going to carry on the message. And when you see your kid, and you see your kid, you know, coming into the masjid, wearing that thobe or wearing that abaya, and like just feeling the Ramadan vibes. And, and I will say this. I know a lot of people in here maybe don't have kids. And one of the most annoying things for people who don't have kids are kids. So when you don't see a kid, I see it all the time. When I fly on planes and like when I'm, people who don't have kids are like, ah, ah. Anyone who has empathy for a child like has some relationship with a child. They could be an uncle, an aunt, they could be a parent, right? They could be an older sibling. So yes, I will tell you the good news and the bad news. The bad news is that for the rest of Ramadan, for the rest of your life, there will be children in the masjid. And that's why on the first night of Ramadan here, I make that announcement. I say, we are a family-friendly masjid, right? So if you want to pray somewhere that doesn't have kids, I suggest the Islamic Association of Carrollton. I suggest, you know, this, 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 this. Not saying don't, their kids don't go there, but we are a place that will let kids come here. Because what happens is when kids are six years old, we keep telling them what? Get out of here, get out of here. And then 16, we're like, where are you? But for one decade, we've been saying, get out of here. So they're listening to us. <laughs> They're, doing, they're actually obeying. So what we have to do is when they're six, we have to say, come, come, come on, come on. Seven, come on. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Come on, come on. Then when they're 16, they're the ones that are in here, front row, running the place. Because for a decade, they've been told you belong here. So bringing your kids, may Allah reward you. That is, you are literally building, you're like a nation builder. You're building an ummah. You know, and the children that we have, these young kids, man, this, we're, we're one foot in, man. They're the ones that are going to have to carry the, the La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. And we have to prepare the world for them and make sure that they can do it. And how can we do that if we don't let them come to the masjid? That Turkish proverb, right? If you don't hear the laughter of children in the back of the masjid, then know that you're in trouble. That's what it is, man. So as much as people want to complain, like, oh, they're making noise. And then we, we responded. We got babysitting. We did child care, right? Child prison, but child care. You know, it was nice. And then we turned the air conditioning way down so they get cold and slow and they can't make noise. No, I'm just joking. Uh, but we do what we could. But having grace and having mercy for people, having, don't, not making people feel guilty for bringing their children is one of the best good deeds you can do in, in, in the masjid. And in fact, congratulating them, having candy, having little, you know, kind words, high-fiving the little boys and girls, telling them, I'm proud of you. They don't know who you are, but they'll be, you're older to them. You're a role model. If you smile at them and give them a high-five, it takes two seconds out of your day, but you know what? Wallahi, they remember that. There was a guy, actually, that I was, one time I was spending time with him, and he's, he used to tell me how he hated this one sheikh, and this sheikh was, like, so beloved to the rest of the world. It was such a weird, such a weird, like, moment. I can't, I'm not going to say the sheikh's name, but the guy was like, I hate him. And I was like, that's so weird. It's like someone saying they hate Mufti Mank. Like, you're weird. You're like certified. You're a criminal, right? Everyone loves Mufti Mank. So, mashallah. Or Sheikh Omar. Like, who hates Sheikh Omar? Get out of here. We don't want you. Boo, this guy stinks, right? So, oh, brother. <laughs> so, if you say you don't love someone that's universally beloved, like, you're on the wrong side. You're on the wrong team. So, he said that. I remember one time he said that. And I was like, why? Why, why do you hate him? And he told me. And again, I'm not going to I'm not going to accept it like what he said. But he said, I remember one time when I was younger, I met him at a conference and I went up to him and I said salam and he didn't smile at me. Okay. Now, we all have the same thought which is like, man, you were 6, you know, you were 7, like maybe you didn't see it correctly. Maybe he was like worried about where his kids were. You know, there's a million excuses. But the the unfortunate fact remains the same, which is that kids remember things. And we have to do our best to make sure that they remember good things about the house of Allah. 
you might be the reason that these kids keep coming back because you did one nice thing. And imagine that on the Day of Judgment. This person who lived their life in the masjid, they show up on the Day of Judgment, and you have this mountain of good deeds being pulled to you, and you say, what is this? And it's a person saying, you're the reason. That lollipop you gave me, it put sweetness in my attachment to the masjid, and you're the reason why. Just because of that one moment, may I ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us, inshallah, and make us those who invite, not indict. Ya Rab. Okay, may Allah Ta'ala give us a good ending to this month. The next part of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, so far we've gone over the few different portions of this hadith when the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, when he was, uh, uh, um, you know, giving this advice to Ibn Abbas. So the advice the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Ihfad Allah, Ihfadka. And then he continued, Ihfad Allah, Tajidhu Amamaka. You will find Allah in front of you. Protect the relationship. You, Allah will protect you. You will find him in front of you. We just did the last one last week, which is what? Ta'arraf ilayhi fi rakhai ya'rifka fi shiddati. If you know Allah in your good times, then Allah will know you in your bad times. If you are not a fair weather, a fair weather believer, that you only know Allah when times are difficult. You only come to him when you need help. But when times are good, it's like, who is Allah? I did this. I earned this. If you're able to remember Allah as the source of your blessings, whenever anything happens, then in the times where you're struggling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you. Now, the last one, or the, he kind of the beginning of the end of the advice. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ He says, when you need to ask, when you need to ask, and we're going to stop there. All right, because this hadith is so deep. The Prophet ﷺ here is teaching us a really important ethic of being Muslim. And that is that nobody here can do this whole thing on their own. All right, community. Nobody can do this whole Muslim thing by themselves. If a person wants to be Muslim, but at the same time be isolated, they're going to find themselves in a very difficult place. There's a reason why all the deeds that we do, there's greater reward if we do them what? together in congregation. If you pray by yourself, you get rewarded. If you pray in congregation, you get up to 70 times the reward of the person who prays in an isolated situation. So whenever there's a chance for you to do something with somebody else as a Muslim, you are increased because community is a protection of its own. Part of that community is the resource of being able to seek help. That's why we're here for each other. We need to seek assistance. So the Prophet Sallallahu He's telling this young man, Ibn Abbas, that there is no shame in asking for help. How many of you have ever been taught, like as a child, that to ask for help is like, Aib. anybody? It's like, wrong, don't do it. Like, don't ask for help. You're going to embarrass us and your family and our lineage and the goats that we own. They're all going to be embarrassed because of you. You asked for help. I'll, I'll, man, one time I taught at a school and this kid would not even share. I was sharing my food with him. Imagine if I asked him for food. I was sharing my food with him. And I offered, I had grapes, and I was like, have some grapes. And he said, no, 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 no. And then everyone around us is eating, and he's not eating. He has no food. So I'm like, hey, everybody, let's all share our food. I kind of encourage us, you know, the other co-teacher and myself and some of this. Let's put it together. We'll all eat like a family. Because I realized this young man didn't have his lunch. Maybe he forgot it or something. And he just kept like saying, no, no, no. And then finally, he told us, he's like, my mom says that if I take food from people, they'll think that I'm begging. That's what he said. Yeah, I mean, the laughter, it's interesting. Ajib, right? And we're laughing because we're like, hey, you want those fries? Or like, are you, are you done with that? Like, <laughs> can I cop the rest of your drink? Like, you know, when you get to adulthood, like your name is Aib. Like you're just do everything. But as a child, there was this shame that was associated with asking. Now, it's true. It's true. Asking too much, becoming a burden on other people is not good. That's true. But, we don't want to overcorrect, right? One extreme should not push us to the other. We don't want to overcorrect where because we're afraid of being a burden or being the person that asks too much, that we never ask. In fact, we reject. Like somebody is willingly, ready, help. Like, hey, let me help you. No, 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 I don't need your help. Even though you're desperate for help. I want you to think of like when you carry the groceries in. Hey, you need help? No, I got it. 72 bags tearing up your knuckles. You're like, I got this. No, ask for help. So part of being a Muslim 
is that when we do ask for help, it's okay. And we should not shame anybody for asking for help, nor should we feel ashamed when we need help. Part of the whole idea of being together is that we're here for one another, okay? However, however, in the process of seeking help, there's what we call tartib. There's a sequence. Now, most of our sequence, it begins with asking everybody for help. And then once we realize that nobody can help us, what do we arrive at? Who do we arrive at at the end of that list? Who? Allah, right? First, we ask everybody, like, hey, can you hook me up? Hey, can you take care of this? Hey, do you know anybody? Hey, hey, da, 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 da. Then once, like, seven people have said, no, leave me alone. Then we're like, Allahumma, Rabbana. You know? Start texting the shaykh, like, what dua, can I, what surah can I read that will do this for me? And that's where the Prophet, Sallallahu now was correcting his tartib. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ if you need to ask, or really, either means when. When you need to ask, because you're going to need to ask. You can't do this on your own. When you need to ask, فَاسْأَلِلَّهِ Ask Allah. Ask Allah. And when you read the commentary of what the scholars said, they say, this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands over and over again. وَاسْأَلُ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِ In the Quran, Allah ta'ala says, Ask Allah for His bounty. For his bounty, meaning Allah is not upset or shy or annoyed when people ask for things from him. Naturally, the first person you go to on your list of requesting people is the one who's the most generous. You're not going to go to the one who's the most stingy. So when you want something and you know you need a ride, or you're not going to ask a person who's really busy or doesn't have a car. If you need a ride, you're going to ask someone who has a car and you know who has time. Their bounty indicates whether or not you should ask them. Who is more full of generosity than Allah? Who has more to give than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nobody. And his favor and his bounty never decreases. Allah can give you exactly what you need and what you want. And it does not take away from his resource at all. He's unlimited. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he said that when Allah gives, Allah can give to whatever you ask. And the dua that we make and the imagery that the Prophet ﷺ planted in our mind is what? That if Allah were to give us everything that we ask for, all of us, the entire ummah, if all of humanity were to gather together outside, just like today at 1.40 p.m., if all of humanity were to gather together outside and beg Allah for what they wanted, and Allah gave every single per person what they wanted, we are told that this would not deplete Allah's stores, His resources, even more than a needle takes water out of the ocean when you dip it in and pull it out. So now why are we shy? Like, why are we afraid? Why, why are we hesitant to ask Allah when he can give everybody everything and not be depleted a drop from an ocean? Subhana. So Allah Ta'ala, he commands us and he says, ask from his bounty. Ibn Mas'ud he tells us that the Prophet ﷺ one time was commenting on this ayah. Isn't that so amazing, by the way? Imagine that you're sitting with the Prophet ﷺ and an ayah comes up in the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ says, let me explain to you what this means. Yeah, I mean, like, we hear teachers say that and we're like, okay, show me the books. Tell me where that came from. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ, he's like, yeah, when this was revealed to me, you're like, you know, you got your hand. <laughs> when this was, you got your legs kicking behind, you know. Yeah. <laughs> When this was revealed to me, subhanAllah, man. Like, could you imagine? In Jannah, inshallah. In Jannah, we'll be able to sit and ask. Tell us the story, Ya Rasulullah. Tell us how, what was it like? What was it like when you first received revelation? Like, what thoughts were going on through your Can you imagine sitting with him? Endless nights, endless chai, just sitting with the Prophet, sallam, eating dates and just enjoying his company. Tell us the story of the Quran, Ya Rasulullah, from your mouth. What was it like? So Ibn Mas'ud, he says that the Prophet, sallam, he said about this particular uh, ayah, he says, Sallallahu min fadlihi fa inna allaha yuhibbu an yus'ala. Ask Allah, that's why he's commanding you, because Allah loves, loves when he is asked. He loves it. We talked about this in the khatra the other night. Human beings, we don't like to be asked. It, you know, if someone comes up and asks, or if I ask you, you're doing a million calculations in your head already. 
Okay, how much time is this going to take? Do they need money? Da, 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 da. What, you know, okay, hold on. Let me see if I got enough time. It's very rare that you meet someone that you're like, you know, can I ask you a favor? And the person's like, absolutely. Usually it's like, can I ask you a favor? And they're like, it depends. And what they're trying to do is right. They're trying to see, am I, can I, do I have capacity for this? Do I have the ability? Or is this outside of my scope? It's responsible, sure. But what I'm trying to say is, Allah is not like us. As much as we maneuver and slip out of things because we don't want to help or we don't want to do it, imagine now that Allah has the opposite amount but ever more infinite of love of taking care of whatever you ask for. Allah Ta'ala loves when he is asked. Another narration says that when a servant comes to Allah and asks Allah, Allah feels shy. Can you imagine? Allah feels shy. For what? To turn the servant away without putting something in their hand that they're asking for. It's like someone coming and saying, like, do you have a date? Do you have water? And you're like, no. You would feel horrible. So the servant comes to Allah and says, oh, Allah, please. Allah feels shy. The hadith says he feels shy. That a servant comes begging Allah and then the servant turns around and leaves and the person leaves as empty-handed as they were when they showed up. So he says, ask Allah because Allah loves to give. So Allah Ta'ala actually loves to give. It's his preference. It's what he wants. And the analogy that one of my teachers taught me is he said, do you know how normally you don't want to be bothered? Like people generally, your nafs is like, don't bother me, right? Anyone else? No, I'm just a bad person. Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about. You have people come up to you to ask you for something. I'm not talking about your friends and family and those people you love. You love your community. That's fine. I'm talking about, you know, like, you sit on the plane, you know, you got your aisle seat or your window seat and someone's like, can I trade seats with you? You're like, which one do you have? They're like a middle. Or I'm, I'm right in the middle. Do you mind trading? At that moment, you're like, why did you do this to me? You're making me the villain now, right? But really you're the villain, right? You're, this is my origin story. This is why I became evil. So I fly too much. You can tell. So, so just like we find it annoying and burdensome and, ah, oh man, when people come and we don't know them and they're seeking and they're asking, asking, asking. Imagine the person texting you over and over again, calling you over and over. You see their number, you see their name, and you're like, God, what does this person want? Allah equally loves in an opposite paradigm or dimension when we ask him with that frequency, with that intensity, with that urgency. He loves it. Why? Because my sheikh said, he loves it because it's so easy for him to give it. And he loves it because for him, he is al-Wahhab. He is the one that gives gifts. He is the one that loves to give to people. He's the one that's the gift giver. And so when you have a gift ready for somebody, you know, if I had a gift here ready for somebody, I would be excited to see you walk in. You walk in the room, I'm like, yes, I got that gift in my office. I can't wait to give it to them. Now imagine Allah has that feeling, that will, that irada. Allah wants to give the gift to everybody, but he says, what? Ask me. Just ask, and I will give. Okay? In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us another principle of asking. Anyone here make dua for big things? Raise your hand if you make dua for, like, big things. Okay. So make dua for, like, marriage, job. Hold on, let me start. Jannah. Okay, good. Forgiveness. Okay, yeah. I was trying to be a little bit more ideal and less real. Okay. Jannah, forgiveness, world peace. Okay, all this kind of stuff. And then, of course, we, uh, if, if, you know, marriage, job, this, this. Um, and then sometimes, ajib, like we, 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 it's almost like we decide where is too insignificant. Like we have a, li a line. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like under this line, don't ask Allah. Ask your family. Over this line, don't ask your family. Ask Allah. You know what I mean? But the Prophet Sallallahu said, when it comes to God, when it comes to Allah, there is no threshold where it's inappropriate to ask. He says in this narration, he says, everyone should ask Allah for all of their needs. Everything. The companions were like, okay. And the Prophet Sallallahu he pulled the famous Sheikh Mikhail Smith line. He said, no, y'all ain't feeling me, right? He said, do you know what I'm saying? Ask Allah for all of your needs. The companion said, okay, hadr, like we'll do it. He said, even if it's the strap on your sandal, a, in English, your shoelace. Even if it's a shoelace 
on your shoe that is untied and you need a new one or it's broken, ask Allah for that. Now, let's, do, let's deconstruct this a little bit together. This practice of asking Allah for everything is one of the most spiritually beneficial and perhaps one of the most uplifting practices that a person can have. You know what? You want to know why? Okay. Because my teacher explained this to me one time. He said, Allah gives you everything as it is. Allah gives you everything as it is. You're, you, right now, but I don't know if you guys can smell, there's food being prepared for you in the other hall. Okay? How many of you made dua for food tonight? Thank you. We're all honest. Okay? We're like, you know what? The first of Ramadan, I might have been like, all right, but we're on the last day of Ramadan. I'm just kind of, or the, you know, the, the, the last, uh, uh, leading into the last night of Ramadan. I'm going to be honest. Nobody in here made dua. Oh, Allah, give me food tonight. Nobody made that dua, right? So when you go there and you get the food and you eat it, you're going to be like, Alhamdulillah. But it's going to be one of those Alhamdulillahs. But let's say that you're sitting in here now and we make dua. And you say, oh Allah, from your grace, from your bounty, from your generosity, oh Allah, please provide me with something to eat tonight. And then you go over there and you have your dinner. By making dua for everything, you actually catalyze and expedite your relationship with Allah to get a higher levels very quickly. Because now, instead of seeing these things as being products of the universe or just things that happen, right? Coincidence. Every single thing that you ask for is from Allah. Now, Allah already knows this, but we don't know it. Every single thing that we have is from Allah. We just have not taken the time to identify that by making dua for it. If we make dua for those things, then when they happen, the heart is filled with appreciation for Allah. But you might ask yourself, and I've dealt with this before. People come up and saying like, oh man, you know what? I have everything that I've wanted, but I don't feel grateful to Allah for it. I have everything that I've wanted, but I don't feel grateful. The person literally starts listing it off. I have a great job. I have a great family. I have this. I have a house. I da da da. But I don't feel grateful. I still complain. Da 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 da. Right? The real problem is not that you can't recognize the blessing. The real problem is that you haven't connected that this is from Allah in the first place. And then what happens? Allah tests us. He takes it away. He gives you a flat tire. Something goes wrong in your house. You miss a flight, you get sick, your marriage has a bumpy road, something goes wrong. And then you realize, oh, subhanAllah, I need to bring Allah back into this equation. Just like I neglected him before, I need to bring him back in. And that's where my heart connects. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, ask Allah for everything. Ask him for every single thing, even if it's the strap of your shoe. Okay? Allah Ta'ala here, the Prophet ﷺ also explained he said, when you ask other people, it damages your reputation. You guys know what I'm talking about? What does it do when you ask other people for things? What do they tend to do? They ignore you, right? Oh man, here he comes asking for more help. This person, all they want is something. The Prophet Sallallahu says, when people ask other people, their reputation is ruined. But when you ask Allah, your reputation is increased. The angels know your name. The angels repeat your name. Your name becomes familiar to the angels. Because when you seek from Allah, who delivers your dua to Allah, right? The angels go and notify Allah, even though he knows. The angels carry your name up to the heavens and they say, Ya Allah, this person is calling upon you. And then Allah Ta'ala asks the angels, what are they asking for? And the angels say, Ya Allah, they're asking for your Jannah in the narration that's very well known. And Allah Ta'ala asks, he goes, that's interesting. Have they ever seen my Jannah? And the angels say, Ya Allah, they haven't. They haven't. And then Allah says, what would they do? What would they do had they seen my Jannah? How would they ask for it? And the angels say, oh Allah, they would ask for it a million times, much more than they're asking for it now. If they'd seen it, can you imagine? If I saw a river of mango lassi, I don't know that I could ever stop praying for it. Like, that would be one of those, you know, they say you can't unsee certain things. If you saw in Jannah what your heart desired, which for me now I've shared in a moment of vulnerability with all of you, is a river of mango lassi, right? I haven't told you about the lake of banana milkshake yet, okay? I guess I did. All right, so 
if you saw that, and if you saw what was waiting for you in paradise, the angels said, oh Allah, they would never ever, they would never ever stop asking. They would never do anything that would inhibit and stop them from being able to reach it. And then Allah Ta'ala asks, you know, what, what do they say about my, my hellfire? And then the angels say, oh Allah, they, they, they are seeking your protection from it. Allah Ta'ala says, have they ever seen it though? Have they seen the punishment? Have they heard the screams? Have they been able to witness the torture and the punishment of those people that rejected Allah and rejected virtue and chose vice? And the angels say, no, the Allah, they haven't. Allah says, what would they do if they have seen my hellfire? And the angels say, oh Allah, they would absolutely give their entire energy and effort to seeking your protection from it and they would never do a single thing that would put them in risk of entering into it. And because a person asks Allah and the angels recognize that ask and they carry your ask up to Allah and they carry your request up to Allah because of that, Allah Ta'ala says, give my servant what they're asking for. This is what happens. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ If you need to ask, ask Allah. Okay? Now, the other side of this question is, okay, I'm going to ask Allah, and then what? And then what? You know, I'm asking Allah for a, for a job, but what happens next? I'm asking Allah for help, but what happens next? Next, And this is where we look to the stories of all of the prophets, and we try to see, okay, what was their methodology? When they sought something from Allah, what did they do next? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers du'as, and he answers du'as in different ways, right? Now, there's, number one, he could answer it for you immediately. So you ask Allah for something and it happens immediately. Anyone here ever had that happen before? You made a du'a and it was answered immediately? What was it? Okay, you lost your phone. Made du'a and boom, you found it, right? MashaAllah. I think we've all had a similar, whether it's like a remote control, a phone, right? Keys, passport before you're flying. It always shows, it always goes lost like the day before you're flying internationally. You make du'a and it appears. Okay, anyone else? You had an instantaneous answer to your du'a? Anybody? Yeah. You made du'a for a cat and you got a cat a few days later. Life is good. It was really, I trust you. I'll take your word for it, right? She goes, it was really random. Okay, mashallah, but you got it. You wanted a cat and you got a cat. What's the cat's name? Bubbles. There you go. What, is there a better name than Bubbles for a cat? Allahu Akbar. Is the cat white? Okay, mashallah. May Allah Ta'ala preserve bubbles and make him, make him the coolness of your eyes. Inshallah. Okay? As long as you take care of his litter box. Okay, so you make dua, it gets answered. Anyone else? You make dua, it gets answered quickly? Yeah. Oh. Your friend invited you for iftar cross state and you didn't know you were moving and then you moved and you made the iftar? That's actually insane. <laughs> your, friend's dura, your friend's invite was serious. That's, a, that's incredible. How was the food? I have to ask. It was good. Okay, it was right. Alhamdulillah. I know we're not, we're not focused on that, but I was just curious. MashaAllah. Okay, very good. Anyone else make dua and it just opened up? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Wanted to buy a Quran online, wasn't available, wasn't happening. And then all of a sudden the friend calls and says, hey, I, by the way, I have this extra Quran I want to give you. And it's the same one. MashaAllah. So these du'as happen, you make them and Allah answers them. That's one category of how Allah answers du'a. There's another category. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer it, but he will delay it. He'll delay it. Okay. Anyone had that experience where Allah answered it, but not when you asked? Can you share what it was? Yeah. Oh boy. MashaAllah. He made dua in Ramadan to get married. 
Is she, uh, she made, oh, Allah Akbar. The movie's in production. You made Dua to get married. She also made Dua too. He, he wanted to make sure he's like, it wasn't just one sided. I was also being sought, okay? I also am, you know, mashallah. So he made Dua to get married. She was making Dua as well. And then on Eid, they met. Can I ask how you guys met? Online. There you go, mashallah. And now here you are. Married for two years, mashallah, it looks like. Three years. Allahu Akbar. Well, your, your anniversary, it was like, it's like impossible to forget now. It's Eid al-Fitr. Or no, it's not. Well, it's, that's, that's, the, that's the cute anniversary. Take notes, all right, big dog? All right. Let me know. Your invoice is in the mail. So, so he made dua. She's making dua. And again, like you make dua, you, you say ameen, you close your hands and you're like, okay. <laughs> you know, and you're like, any day now, Allah. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm ready. Like, <laughs> You check your dua, you're like, did I say like a time? Did I? And then, you know, and then you met her on Eid and you're like, okay, this might, might not work. And then six months later, right, you're doing the proposal and you're happy and you're sitting there. And again, it's like, okay, it was delayed. But subhanAllah, you know, the time between your dua and when you met this person, like there was, that needed to be delayed, right? It needed to be delayed. Okay, very, that's actually a great story about how that works. Anyone else? You made dua and it was delayed? Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when your husband asked for you, your parents did not say yes immediately. Because you're from a different culture, okay? So hold out, brothers. You can give it. You can, give, you can do it, okay? Just learn a little Urdu, a little Arabic, inshallah, I'll get it done. And then you just made dua, and then eventually what happened? Sure. Mashallah. Oh. So your dad was very understanding, and then it was raining one night super hard, and you're like, this is it. And you made dua. You're like, I heard some sheikh say that raining duas are good. <laughs> so I'm just going to make dua. Yeah. And, and, and subhanAllah, and look, you know what's crazy, actually? I'll tell you a story, because my story was similar. I asked to marry my wife. Uh, the only difference was that I was in college. So my, they were like, I was, uh, I asked to marry her when I was 18. And so her parents were like, and I was like, I got a plan. Don't worry. You know? Um, and, and subhanAllah, you know, it's interesting because again, in your head, you're like, why is this taking so long? Like we, we could be married by now. It's, you know, this and this, but subhanAllah, there's something that can happen in the delay and, and people talk about it later. For example, I don't know if this is true for you, but maybe there was a bonding of the families that needed time, like ripening, you know, like it needed to, people needed to get to know each other better. And maybe if we didn't have that time to get to know each other better as a family, then maybe it wouldn't have worked out, you know, or the guy in question or the girl in question, and maybe it wouldn't work out. So sometimes the delay is not only convenient, sometimes it's actually critical. If the delay were not there, then it's not going to go well. It went, alhamdulillah, it went real well. Alhamdulillah. May Allah Ta'ala bless you guys and both of you, inshallah. Okay? And may Allah Ta'ala keep everyone in this room who wants to get married. May Allah Ta'ala give you a beautiful, beautiful, inshallah, marriage and a wonderful uh, uh, relationship, inshallah. Okay? So I think we're going in a certain direction, so I'm going to change topics, inshallah. <laughs> so let's, this is a hadith, by the way. Um, so... Allah answers your dua. Number two, he delays. Number three, he doesn't answer it in this life. And he gives it to you in the next life. And they say number four, or as a part of that not giving it to you in this life, he uh, replaces it for you and he protects you from something evil that would have befallen you as a result of it. Okay? So those are the four ways in which duas are answered. So the beautiful thing is that the scholars say, and listen to this, very careful, Du'as are never not answered. Du'as are always answered in one of those four ways. They're either immediately answered, they're either please wait answered, they're either not here answered, or not this, but something else answered. And in this life, we're limited to seeing only the ones that are either immediate or after a sl small delay. But I want you to imagine that there's a place where because you sought from Allah so constantly, so frequently, 
that maybe you didn't get everything you intended, but as a result of that, Allah protected you from things that were totally unintended. And Allah shielded you from things that would have destroyed or damaged you that you had no idea. So you asked Allah to give you something. He didn't, but he protected you from something. And then a few years later, a few months later, he gave you something as a replacement. This can only happen if you frequently ask Allah. But if we don't ask Allah, if we don't seek from him, we're left to our own devices. We're making our own decisions. Many of the things that people really struggle with in their life, they didn't genuinely seek from Allah for those things first. And they wonder, like, why am I struggling with this? Well, we have to include Allah in that process. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another method, one of the ways in which he answers du'as for you, and this is beautiful, and we're going to finish with this, is Allah answers your du'as through other people. It's possible that Allah could send someone to answer your du'a or to be an answer for your du'a. But it doesn't mean you leave Allah out of it. It doesn't mean that you ignore him. What it means is that you start by asking Allah, and then once you've asked, now you open your eyes and pay attention, and you look around you. You're asking Allah for a job, and then there's a person who works at the company that you just applied to. Now, you don't sit there and stare at them, and you're like, you realize that Allah is the one who ordained and destined that I was going to be in this environment, in this venue, and Allah brought that person here as well, and because... We're both here. Now we're going to be able to actually have a conversation that might get me the thing that I was praying for. Just like the brother was saying about marriage. Like he's asking Allah, oh Allah, allow me to get married. Give me a wife. She didn't just like, he didn't just like open the door to leave his house and she's right there. She's like, Salaam alaikum, I'm your wife. It's not how these things work. But slowly over time with networks, with connections, with relationships, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places us in a path of the answer that will eventually be what our dua was asking for. But we have to do the part. We have to walk. We have to move forward. Right? So Allah Ta'ala will sincerely, will wait for you to sincerely ask, and then he will place others in your path, and those people will be the answer to your dua. There's the famous you know, uh, uh, story that they tell, like I think churches tell this a lot, where people ask God for help, they're drowning. And they're like, God, help me, God, help me. And there's a boat that comes by and they're like, do you need help? And the person's like, no, God's going to help me. And the boat leaves. And then the next boat comes, do you need help? And the person's like, no, I prayed to God, he's going to help me. And the boat leaves. Eventually the person drowns. After, all, after God sent all these boats, the person drowns. Then the person meets God in the afterlife and says, you know, God, I prayed to you, you didn't help me. God's like, I sent you three boats. Like, what do you mean I didn't help you? You know what I mean? And so many of us are making dua, we're waiting for Jibreel to come down. And to deliver like this DHL Express, like, here's what you wanted. No. Allah facilitates your prayers through the ordinary, through the mundane. You're making dua, which is miraculous. But Allah will facilitate your prayers through the mundane, through the ordinary. You know, think about this. The Prophet wasallam, he prayed to Allah for support. He was given the job of being a messenger. He had to teach people about Islam. He had to encourage people to worship Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very rarely, very rarely sent down angels to help and be the answer to his dua. We do believe in miracles and those were miracles. But we have very few moments in which we know that the mala'ika were sent down to help, right? Think of the battle of Badr, for example, right? But what did Allah give the Prophet sallallahu not just once or twice or three times, but every single day of his life to help strengthen his mission. He gave him a group of people called the Sahaba. And those Sahaba were human beings. They were individuals. They were the best of individuals, but they were like you and I. And so in reality, when you are asking Allah for something, don't ask Allah and then close your eyes. Ask Allah and then open your eyes and do two things. Number one, Look around your life and see who Allah has placed in your life already that can be an answer to your dua. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're, uh, and you say, oh Allah, I'm lonely. Oh Allah, give me companionship. Not just marriage, but give me friendship. Give me brotherhood and sisterhood, right? And then as you're making this dua, you start to like realize like, I went to the masjid tonight and this guy next to me was like really nice to me, man. He invited me to iftar. Or you're like, I live 10 hours away and this girl still invited me for some reason. (laughs) <laughs> and you get in the car and you drive and, and, and Allah has placed 
And for us, it's interesting. The gifts of the du'as we're seeking are sometimes already present. We're just not astute enough. We're just not sharp enough to see it. So that's number one. Number two, and this is the one that gets me very emotional, subhanAllah, is that realize that you might actually someone else's answer to their du'a. Allah may have given you the facilities and the capabilities and the faculties to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Why do you think in Islam it's so important that we help each other? Do you realize that you helping somebody, I'm talking about down to the minimum. There was a lady who came here in the middle of Ramadan. I remember uh, she came by herself with two kids and she came inside and she's pushing a stroller and then she has a toddler. And I think one of the volunteers, one of the Roots volunteers saw her and just went up to her and said, could I help you with anything? Like, do you need anything? And she goes, it's kind of funny. She goes, yes, can you please watch my kids? And the volunteer is like, definitely did not sign up for that. But welcome home. Let's do this, right? The lady, the sister, she runs to the bathroom, uses the bathroom, comes out. She goes, you have no idea how much the whole drive over I was begging Allah, oh Allah, how am I going to use the bathroom? I had these two kids. Then she goes, I walked in and not even 10 seconds into me walking into this building. She said, beautiful building. She a building, right? You walked over and you said, can I help you? And, he go, and she said, you even kind of like pointed at the stroller. And she goes, I thought to myself immediately, I made dua for the bathroom. Again, shoelaces, right? I made dua, oh Allah, I need to use the bathroom. And you sent this individual. And she, she jokingly said, like, you're like an angel. And I was like, I can assure you he's not, right? Like, <laughs> he's a human. But the point being is that person in that moment, which was very small, but for a mother of two children by herself, it's not a small deal. So you have the faculty and, and the capability to be the answer to someone's dua with whatever talent or whatever access Allah has given you. Maybe there's somebody that's looking for a friend. You can be their friend. Maybe there's somebody that's looking for a resource, a connection, a network, learn, to learn something, and you can be that for them. I, the story that I, that I, that I want to finish with tonight, it's one that I tell often, but I love this story. It's on Hajj. May Allah Ta'ala invite us all to Hajj. Hajj is the, it's the, the environment of answered du'as, like so many. It's so just absolutely powerful there. I remember one time I was at Hajj, and I got this uh, good friend of mine, Sheikh Ahmed Billu, and he hands me, the worst thing you could ever hand a person on Hajj. You guys know what that is? Who's heard the story before? He hands me a person's passport. He says, someone lost their passport on Hajj. This person might as well just sign up to be a Saudi at this point. You're not going home. You don't have a passport, right? So he hands me his passport. And he's like, and I, I give it right back to him. <laughs> I'm like, dude, this is cursed. Like, I don't want to touch this thing, right? We're all just like, you know, whatever we got to do. So he's like, whose passport is this? We're trying to find out. It's very difficult, subhanAllah. It's very difficult to try to locate a passport, uh, the owner of a passport on Hajj. So we're sending messages to all these groups and we're trying to communicate. We're not the only group. So we're sending messages to everybody, a WhatsApp or like passport. You know, this person, this name, please meet us. No answer, no answer. Finally, it's the day that we, we uh, are leaving for, for Minna. And once you leave for Minna, it's kind of like, even less of a chance, at least when you're in Mecca, when you're near the Haram, you're all concentrated. Different hotels, but you could always arrange a meetup. In Mina, good luck, dude. Like, good luck, you know? And it's the morning, it's Fajr. We're after Fajr, we're there, we're doing our halaqahs, and we're like kind of reminding everybody, hey, go downstairs, get your bags, head to the buses, we're heading to Mina, you know, do, 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 do whatever. And Sheikh Ahmed, my good friend Sheikh Ahmed Billu, he comes to me, he says, hey, you remember that passport? And I was like, yes. And he goes, here it is. He goes, you go, Sheikh Ahmed said, you go and take this over to Imam Majid, who's over and he's giving his, uh, his dars. And I go, huh? He goes, he, go, you'll, you'll trust me. I go, okay. So I walk over, this giant, like white dude, Hagrid, walk over to this halaqa and they're finishing up. And I said, Imam. And he says, yes, yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Abdurrahman, how are you? I said, Assalamu alaikum. I said, I have something for you. He goes, what? And as I was walking over, I saw them all making dua. And then they finished their dua. It was like very intense dua. And then they were, it was normal. If you're going to Mina, you're leaving the haram. Everyone's very emotional. I said, I have this passport. Before I can even get the T out from passport, 
I hear, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, people are going crazy. Which isn't scary when you're in Saudi. It's not like, because you're not a terrorist there, right? You're just like, if you do it in America, it's kind of weird. Like, Allah Akbar, they're screaming Allah Akbar. And I go, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm just like standing there, I'm like, you know? And this guy, and I think it's his wife, is, they just burst out into tears and they're just like on the floor crying. And Imam Majid just starts laughing and everyone's kind of like happy, celebration, this and that. And I go like, what happened? And he goes, this passport, he held it, he took it, he goes, this passport has been the focus of our entire group's dua for like four days. He goes, we would call like the, the awliya of Allah. We were calling like shuyukh across the world. We were like slaughtering camels to like see if Allah would accept our dua. And, uh, you know, like offering sacrifices to Allah. Like, oh Allah, please, you are the Lord of us and you are the Lord of the passport. Please return the passport back to us. And they're begging, like literally he's like, we were begging Allah. And he goes, we're here in the haram. And he goes, and we made dua. And he said some very emotional like dua where he was like, oh Allah, we're here in your house. And you never, you never ever, oh Allah, leave anybody in your house untaken care of. You are the best of hosts. So please take care of them. And, and he goes, as soon as we finished, he goes, you showed up and you said, here's your passport. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah. And I, 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 you know, I walked back and I was just kind of like in that moment. I was like, wow, man. And then I, I realized like Sheikh Ahmed could have done that himself. He didn't need me to walk it over. He might have just been lazy, but he could have been the answer to their dua. But because of Allah's fadl, Allah chose me to be a part of that equation. And now, who knows, like till this day, maybe the fact that my kids pray or I don't know, maybe anything good in my life is because there's a couple who went to Hajj who I didn't even know who made dua for me in Mina. Said, oh Allah, take care of that person who got my passport back to me. And maybe the shield that's covering me from all of the tests that could be surrounding me is because of the dua of a stranger that I was just randomly involved in the answer to their prayer. And it was just Sheikh Ahmed Billu, my friend, who was like, go give this back to them. The point of the story is like, when you function as a person who helps others, you're not just helping them. You're actually a part of their dua being answered. And who knows what dua they make for you when you, when you take care of their dua. May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to be the person who calls upon him and answers for those who call upon him. May Allah Ta'ala make us those people that accepts all of, the, all of the challenges that we come to and we make dua to Allah as a result of those challenges. May Allah Ta'ala keep us close to him. May Allah Ta'ala answer all of our du'as this month. May Allah Ta'ala always make us start by seeking from him alone. And may Allah Ta'ala allow us to always be people that recognize his blessing in our life countlessly and his fadl in our life endlessly. And that every single moment we see is a moment that Allah Ta'ala gave us. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us those that are cognizant of his blessings, that we're not blind to them, but that we see them. Even if it's the strap of our shoelaces, we know that this is from Allah. Even if it's a bite of a sandwich, we know that this is from Allah. Even if it's the sip of a drink, we know this is from Allah. Even if it's the bite of a date, we know this is from Allah. Even if it's catching a green light, we know that this is from Allah. Even if it's getting a discount of one dollar, we know that this is from Allah. Oh Allah, do not let our minds or hearts ever wander from realizing that you are the one that provides for us and you are the one that takes care of us, oh Allah. Oh Allah, allow us to be those people that constantly recognize your blessings and your grace upon us. And oh Allah, allow us to be as generous and as giving as we can to others around us. Oh Allah, allow us to be the answer to others' du'as. Allow us to be those people that can facilitate the prayers of others. And by means of that, oh Allah, answer our prayers. Amin, amin, ya rabbil alameen. Wa salli allahumma ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfirka wa natubu ilayk. It is Maghrib time, inshaAllah. So we're going to be handing out the du'as, or the uh, dates. <laughs> uh, but you can continue making du'a for yourself, inshaAllah, as you're breaking your fast, inshaAllah. <laughs>